is here. Now, broadcasting from, from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Mark Levin here, our number, 877-381-3811. Hello. 877-381-3811. All right, I'll sum up last night's election, even though I summed it up before I went off the air, but I particularly liked the analysis by my friend David Brody. He says, uh, this victory in New Hampshire by Trump is much bigger much bigger than people realize. 70% of the Republicans who voted, voted for Trump. That's a landslide if you have a true Republican primary. It's not a general election. It's not supposed to be. It's a Republican primary. But even more, the electorate was more moderate and liberal this time compared to 2016 by nine points. 64% of primary voters said they were not Make America Great Again voters. Just 24% of primary voters were, quote, very conservative, unquote, compared to 52% in Iowa. Nikki Haley had the endorsement of the popular governor of New Hampshire. Uh, I think his name's Sununu. Nikki Haley invested heavily in New Hampshire. Nikki Haley spent tons of time in New Hampshire. Nikki Haley had, 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 exactly had her two-person race on supposedly her type of political terrain. And yet, despite it all, all these factors, Donald Trump won easily. Easily. He's the first president since Nixon and one of the very few in the Republican primaries to win New Hampshire three times in a row. New Hampshire is not Alabama. It's not Idaho. It's New England. Last time I checked. And Republicans tend to be more moderate, more liberal. Not all, of course. Trump won 70% of them. And he won New Hampshire significantly. Despite Nikki Haley's best efforts, the Democrat Party's best efforts, the ruling class and establishment's best efforts, and the billionaire's best efforts. Not only that, Trump did something I don't think any Republican candidate has done, certainly not in recent history. He got over 50% of the vote in Iowa and over 50% of the vote in New Hampshire. Look, I've been around a little while. I worked in the Reagan campaigns in 76 and 80. I've never seen anything like this. Now, it'll never be possible for Trump to win 49 states. It has nothing to do with Trump. The demographics have changed. It's that simple. But, you know, I do research for this program. I'm all set to go, but I'm researching right up to the last second. And Mr. Producer will tell you this, and I found something very interesting that I want to share with you. There was a piece done in New York Magazine, and it was done eight years ago. 
on Reagan and Trump. Now, when it comes to personalities, Reagan and Trump couldn't be more different. But there are many similarities. Many similarities. And the gentleman who writes this piece is Benedict Evans. Actually, that's the photograph. I don't know who writes this piece the way these... Oh, Frank Rich. Oh, good Lord. Frank Rich, of all people. Who loves me. I think he's still around, but who knows. The Reagan archive shows that there's no indication that the two men, Trump and Reagan, had anything more than a receiving line acquaintanceship. Trump doesn't appear in the president's voluminous diaries. But of all the empty boasts that have marked Trump's successful pursuit of the Republican nomination, this is before he was elected in 2016, his affinity to Reagan may have the most validity and the most pertinence to 2016. To understand how Trump has advanced to where he is now and why he's been underestimated almost every step, and he still is today. Today he's underestimated. And why he has a shot at vanquishing Hillary Clinton in November, he wrote in 2016. Few roadmaps are more illuminating than Reagan's unlikely path to the White House. One is almost tempted to say that Trump has been studying the Reagan playbook, but to do so would be to suggest that he actually might, okay, have looked at the book. Before the fierce defenders of the Reagan faith collapse into seizures at the bracketing of their hero with the crudest and most vacuous, says Frank Rich, of course, a left-wing clown, but still, I'm getting to a point. Presidential candidate, let me stipulate that I'm not talking about Reagan the president and drawing this parallel. Or about Reagan the man, I'm talking about Reagan the candidate. The canny politician who, after a dozen years of failed efforts attended by nonstop ridicule, ended up leading the 1980 GOP ticket at the same age Trump is now, 69. That was back then, of course. And who, like his present-day counterpart, was best known to much of the electorate up until then as a B-list show business personality. Okay, when you read something like this, you're not reading it because you think the author is a nice guy, because this author is not. But there's something illuminating in all the BS, and that's what I'm getting to, so stick with me. It's true that Reagan, unlike Trump, did hold public office before seeking the presidency, though he'd been out of government for six years when he won, But Trump would no doubt argue that his executive experience atop the August Trump Organization more than compensates for Reagan's two terms in Sacramento. Remarkably, though, the Reagan model has proved quite adaptable, both to Trump and to our different times. Trump's tenure at an NBC reality show host is comparable to Reagan's stint hosting the highly rated but disposable General Electric Theater for CBS in the Ed Sullivan era. Trump's embarrassing turn as a supporter, as a supporting player in the 1990 Bo Derek movie. Yeah, I told you the guy's an ass, but stick with me. There's no more egregious than Reagan starring opposite a chimp in Hollywood bedtime for Bozo. While Trump has owned tacky bankrupt casinos in Atlantic City, Reagan was a mere casino surf. The MC of a flop nightclub re- review featuring barbershop harmonite, and he goes on. So he hates Reagan, hates Trump, and of course hates all of us for supporting both. I'm trying to make a point that's very important here, though. I want you to remember that Reagan won two massive landslides. They were said he couldn't win. The Republican establishment tried to stop him. How would he appeal to moderates? How would he get Democrats? But Reagan's and Trump's opposing styles belie their similarities of substance, he writes. Both have marketed the same brand of outrage to the same angry segments of the electorate, faced the same jeering press, attracted some of the same battlefield allies, Roger Stone, Paul Manafort, Phyllis Schlafly, offended the same elites, including two generations of Bushes, outmaneuvered similar political adversaries, and espoused the same conservative populism built broadly on the pillars of jingoistic nationalism, nostalgia, contempt for Washington, and racial resentment. Again, you have to read past the man's race-baiting and so forth. Stick with me. 
They've even endured the same wisecracks about their unnatural coffers. Governor Reagan does not dye his hair, said Gerald Ford at a gridiron dinner in 1974. He's just turning prematurely orange. The Reagan's 1980 campaign slogan, Let's Make America Great Again, is one word longer than Trump's. The world, the word reflects a contrast in their personalities. The invacular versus the autocratic, but not in message. Reagan's apoc- apocalyptic theme, the empire's in decline, is interchangeable with Trump's, even if the Gipper delivered it with a smile. Craig Shirley, who happens to be a dear friend of mine, has a brand new book coming out, and I can't wait to have him on my program. Shirley, longtime Republican political consultant and Reagan acolyte, he's, he's a tremendous historian, has written authoritative books on the presidential campaigns of 76 and 80 that serve as correctives to the sentimental revisionist history that would have us believe that Reagan was cheered on as a conquering hero by GOP elites during his long climb to national power. And this is the nub of the matter, America. To hear the right's triumphalism, recent years, you'd think that only smug Democrats were appalled by Reagan, while Republicans quickly recognized that their party, decimated by Richard Nixon and Watergate, had found its savior. Grassroots Republicans who ran Reagan had been courting for years with speeches, radio addresses, and opinion pieces beneath the mainstream media's radar were indeed in his camp. But aside from a lone operative, John Sears, Shirley wrote, quote, the other major GOP players, especially Easterners and moderates, thought Reagan was a certified Yahoo. Got it? This is what you're hearing now about Trump. By his death in 2004, quote, right, Shirley, they would profess their love and devotion to Reagan and claim they were there from the beginning of 1974, which was a load of horse manure. Even after his election in 1980, Shirley adds, Reagan was never much loved by his own party leaders. After GOP setbacks in the 1982 midterms, a Republican National Committee functionary taped a piece of paper to her door announcing the sign-up for the 1984 Bush for President campaign. Shirley's memories, I have to close my left eye to read this, but stick with me. Shirley's memories are corroborated by reportage contemporaneous with Reagan's last two presidential runs. A poll in 1976 found that 90% of Republican state chairmen judged Reagan guilty of, quote, simplistic approaches, unquote, with, quote, no depth in federal government administration and, quote, no experience in foreign affairs. It was a little different in January 1980 when a U.S. News and World Report survey of 475 national and state Republican chairmen found they preferred George H.W. Bush to Reagan. One state chairman presumably spoke for many when he told the magazine that Reagan's intellect was, quote, thinner than spit on a slate rock, unquote. As Rick Perlstein writes in The Invisible Bridge, the third and latest volume of his epic chronicle, The Rise, of the conservative movement, he says. Both Nixon and Ford dismissed Reagan as a lightweight. Barry Goldwater endorsed Ford over Reagan in 76, despite the fact that Reagan's legendary speak on behalf of Goldwater's presidential campaign in uh, 1964, Time for Choosing, was the biggest uh, boost uh, that Goldwater had received. Only a single Republican senator, and this Republican senator was, in fact, a dear friend and mentor of mine. Paul Axel of Nevada signed on to Reagan's presidential quest from the start, a solitary role that has been played in the Trump campaign by then, excuse me, by uh, former Senator Jeff Sessions. What put off Reagan's fellow Republicans will sound very familiar. He proposed an economic program of 30% tax cuts, increased military spending, a balanced budget, whose math, writes these leftists, was voodoo and then some. He prided himself on not being, quote, a part of the Washington establishment, unquote, and mocked Capitol Hill's buddy system and its collusion with the forces that have brought on us our problems, the Congress, the bureaucracy, the lobbyists, big business and big labor, Reagan said. He kept a light campaign schedule, regarded debates as optional, wouldn't sit still to read briefing books and then either improvised their speeches or worked off index cards 
that contained anecdotes and statistics gleaned from Reader's Digest and the right-wing journal Human Events. He says, well, Reagan was actually quite the intellect. He was incredibly well-read and often did speak contemporaneously. But that aside, that's not my point. Like Trump, but unlike most of his and Trump's political rivals, Reagan was accessible to the press and public. His spontaneity in give and takes with reporters and voters played well, but also gave him plenty of space to disgorge fantasies and factual errors so prolific and often outrageous that he single-handedly made the word gaff a permanent fiction in American play. So it goes on and on and on, you see. And I open the show reading this to you by a radical left-wing Democrat, maybe still writes for the New York Times, but he's writing here in the left-wing New York magazine, to demonstrate to you that many of the substantive efforts to kill Trump, many of the tactics and techniques used to trash Trump by the Republican establishment, by the media, were in fact used against Ronald Reagan. He couldn't win. He appeal. He can't appeal to the moderates. He can't appeal to the Democrats. More when I return. Mark Levin. Let's continue this a little bit. I only have a minute this segment, but there's much more that's very, very interesting. You've heard me say here over and over and over again. They keep bringing back these establishment ruling class commentators. All across the board. The Bush people never go away. Never go away. The McConnell people never go away. The media promotes Susan Collins today. They'll promote Mitt Romney. They're fully behind Nikki Haley. The things they say about Trump, the way they seek to undermine Trump, much of it is very, very similar to what they tried to do to Reagan. So stick with me. I'm not done. I'll be right back. Mark Levin, the great one. The great one, Mark Levin. Dial in now, 877-381-3811. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. The Republican elites of Reagan's day, writes Frank Rich in 2016 at the liberal New York magazine, were as blindsided by Reagan as their counterparts have been blindsided by Trump. Though Reagan came close to toppling the incumbent president at the contested Kansas City Convention in 76, the Ford forces didn't realize they could lose until the devil was at the door. A President Ford committee... Ah, shoot. Hold on, folks. My computer. Stick with me. I'm almost there. Can't wait for AI, Mr. Producer. Where was I? A President Ford Committee campaign statement had maintained that Reagan could not defeat any candidate the Democrats put up. Got that? Reagan could not, quote, could not defeat any candidate the Democrats put up because his, quote, constituency is much too narrow, even within the Republican Party, unquote. You hear this, Mr. Producer? Exactly what they're saying today about Trump. And because he lacked, quote, the critical national and international experience that President Ford has gained through 25 years of public service. Now, in Gerald Ford's memoirs, written after he lost the election to Jimmy Carter, he wrote that he hadn't taken the Reagan threat seriously because he, quote, didn't take Reagan seriously, unquote. Reagan, he said, had a, quote, penchant for offering simplistic solutions to hideously complex problems. And his stubborn insistence that he was always right in every argument. Even so, a Ford campaign memo had correctly identified one ominous sign during the primary season. A rising turnout of Reagan voters that were not loyal Republicans or Democrats and were alienated from both parties 
because neither takes a sympathetic view toward their issues. Now you know why I'm taking time to read this to you. To these voters, the disdain Reagan drew from the GOP elites was a badge of honor. During the primary campaign, New York Times columnist William Sapphire reported with astonishment that Henry Kissinger's speeches championing Gerald Ford and attacking Ronald Reagan were helping Reagan, not Ford. A precursor of how attacks by Trump's establishment adversaries have backfired 40 years later. And I might add, by the phony charges, the phony trials. It's the same instinct. It's the same conservatives. Conservatives, not necessarily Republicans. Much of the press was slow to catch up to a typical liberal establishment take on Reagan could be found in Harper's which called him Ronald Duck, the candidate from Disneyland. That he'd come to be deemed, quote, a serious candidate for president, unquote, the magazine intoned, was a shame and embarrassment for the country. But some reporters who track regular campaign trails sense that many voters didn't care if he came from Hollywood, if his policies didn't add up, if his facts were bogus. Again, this is from a leftist who spent decades attacking conservatives. Or if he was condescended to by Republican leaders or pundits. As Elizabeth Drew, another leftist of the New Yorker, observed in 1976, his appeal, quote, has to do not with competence and governing, but with the emotion he invokes. It's also important to hear what the left-wing media said then. They say the same thing today. The same types of criticism today. Again, I'm not talking about personalities. They couldn't be more different. But when it comes to their upstart campaigns, their outsider status, their substance... And I've said before on this air, on this broadcast, Donald Trump is the most conservative president since Ronald Reagan. Donald Trump is more conservative than Richard Nixon was. Donald Trump is more conservative than George H.W. Bush was. Donald Trump is more conservative than George W. Bush was. And he does it by common sense. He reaches these conservative conclusions. Anyway, let's get back to this. As she put it, Reagan lets people get out their anger and frustration, their feeling of being misunderstood and mishandled by those who have run our government, their impatience with taxes and with the poor and the weak, their impulse to deal with the world's troublemakers by employing the stratagem of punch in the nose. Again, this is from the usual elitist new, uh, reporter perspective, but that's exactly what's taking place against Trump. The Republican establishment, the commentary, he can't reach moderates, he can't reach Democrats. I keep hearing our friend Tarlov say that on Fox. Look at the numbers, look at the numbers, look at the numbers. Ladies and gentlemen, it's New Hampshire. I'm looking at the numbers. I'm just seeing things differently as somebody who has a different perspective than all these. And it's not just liberals. It's some conservatives, so-called moderates. It's hosts. It's guests. It's inside the Beltway types. It's forever, you know, um, campaign hangers on. They're all saying the same thing that they said about Reagan. The power of that appeal was underestimated by his Democratic foes in 1980, even though Carter had to run a populist and attract campaign and attracted some Wallace voters when beating Ford in 1976. By the time he was up for re-election, Carter was an unpopular incumbent presiding over the Iranian hostage crisis, gas shortages, and a reeling economy. Yet surely the Democrats would prevail over Ronald Duck. A strategic memo by Carter's pollster, Patrick Cadell, who, by the way, became a Trump supporter. Passed away a few years back, was really a good guy. He became a Trump supporter. And by the way, he became a supporter of Ronald Reagan, obviously after his death and so forth, but he understood what a great president he was. A strategic memo by Carter's pollster, Patrick Cadell. Laid out the campaign against Reagan's obvious vulnerabilities with bullet points. 
Is Reagan safe? Shoots from the hip, over his head. What are his solutions? But it was the strategy of Cadell's counterpart in the Reagan camp. The pollster who was brilliant, Richard Worthlin. They carried the day with the electorate. Voters wanted to, quote, follow an authority figure. He theorized a leader, a leader who can take charge with authority, return a sense of discipline to our government, and manifest the willpower needed to get this country back on track. Or at least a leader from outside Washington, writes Rich, like Reagan and now Trump, who projects that image, you're fired. Whether he has the ability to deliver or not, well, it clearly did. It's as I've told you before, this reference to Hitler was used against Goldwater. It was used against Nixon. It was used against Reagan. It was used against both Bushes. And now it's used against Trump. And the way the Democrats do this is they say, Trump is no Goldwater. They tried to destroy Goldwater, but now they love him, of course. Trump is no Nixon. I mean, Nixon was bad, but he wasn't as bad as as this. I mean, Watergate pales in comparison. They trashed George H.W. Bush. Now they love him. They despised George W. Bush. But now George W. Bush is, he's, he's, he's swell because he's buddies with Obama and Clinton, you know. And they use Romney and they use McCain and it's all to attack Trump. This is how they do it. Now this is from the hand of a radical left-wing Democrat dressed up as first a journalist and now an opinion writer. Honestly, I don't even know where he is today because I'm not a New York Times uh, subscriber for sure. But it's almost point for point for point, isn't it? The arguments you heard last night, the arguments you hear today, the arguments you heard before last night, that Trump cannot win. He cannot broaden the base. That it's this small group of very conservative people up against the establishment. That's right, MAGA. And they have a problem with this MAGA, even though it means make America great again. They never say what it means. They just use MAGA. Now you know the full story. That what's happening to Trump isn't new. Ronald Reagan was the greatest vote-getter of any Republican in American history. Any. And one of the greatest vote-getters of all time. He won because he was a principal conservative who embraced Americanism, who showed his love for our country on his sleeve, who was not afraid to attack his own party leaders and the Republican establishment, not afraid to attack Washington, D.C. itself and big government. Trump does the same thing. Same thing. Of course, there are differences. But fundamentally, what's being done to Trump was done to Reagan by many of the same people and many of their progeny. It is sad to see the National Review and the Wall Street Journal and even elements in the New York Post try to destroy Trump as well. But there are even conservatives who didn't trust Reagan, didn't think he would get elected. I always laugh at this Rove situation where he he claims, and Craig Shirley calls him and the rest of them out, he, Craig is just terrific, that he was involved heavily in the Reagan campaign. He was involved in trying to stop Reagan in 1980. He was in Texas. He was a Bush guy. That's fine, but why lie about it? He says after the primary was over, he was thoroughly involved, had some leadership positions, but the people there who actually were involved 
in supporting Reagan in 76 and 80 and had real leadership positions say that's not correct. Chris Christie was never a Reaganite, ever. Mitch McConnell was never a Reaganite, ever. Ever. And most of the Republican establishment types were never Reaganites. The Romney family was never Reaganite. Period. So I just want to remind you of these things. I just want to remind you of the tactics, the games. And I am here to give you context and perspective. They basically say the same things about Trump today. I mean, apart from, you know, the language and that sort of thing. As they said about Reagan before, unelectable. And the, and the amazing thing that's even different in Trump's case, he already won an election. And they're still saying he can't. And I know people say that Trump is obsessed on this 2020 election, on the fraud and so forth. And he probably does talk about it too much. But let's not pretend there wasn't fraud. There was massive fraud. It was institutionalized. Why else would 300 Democrat Party radical ambulance chasing slip and fall lawyers be going into court? Particularly in battleground states to change the electoral rules. They were able to change it with Democrat state judges, many of whom were elected and the others were appointed by Democrat governors. Now that's a form of corruption, is it not? That's a form of fraud, is it not? Of course it is. Particularly where the federal constitution says it's the state legislature, in so many words, that make those decisions. Although the Supreme Court's very skeptical of this. Who cares? It's what it says. And there's no question that when you eliminate voter ID, there's no question when you eliminate signatures and dates from absentee ballots, there's no question when you have the equivalent of mailboxes, unsecured, unmonitored, where people can drop ballots. And there's no question that when you have voter harvesting, which is actually collecting ballots and counting those votes after the election is over, there is simply no question that all that is done not to advance the franchise of voting, not to increase voting by people who have a legal right to vote, but it is all intended to advance the power, the electoral chances of America's autocratic party, the Democrat Party. And anybody who tells you differently is a liar. A contemptible liar. And they're going to try it again. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Now, I do want to be clear about something. Of course, there's not an exact parallel. And the parallel I'm drawing is really about the media, the establishment, and how they treat two outsider candidates who are quite successful. And I want to be clear about something else. I don't always agree with Donald Trump on the issues. I often do. But I don't believe that conservatives should be trying to sabotage him and sabotage his election. When you look what we're up against and what's going on in this country... We're in dire straits. And I must say, Donald Trump, four years in office, was a superb president, substantively. And they impeached him twice. They launched a criminal investigation. They were constantly going after his family. Even under those circumstances, and of course today the circumstances are even worse than when Reagan was running because they have indicted him on 91 phony counts in five different or four different jurisdictions. Uh, Most of them are Democrat jurisdictions. The charges are bogus. I don't care what anybody else has to say. They can defend it if they wish. I choose not to because I know what I'm talking about. But there are some things I disagree with him on. And he said something today or did about Taiwan, and I want to share that with you. 
You should see the racist attacks on Tim Scott all throughout the radical left Democrat Party corrupt media and their surrogates like Mediaite. How they're mocking him. They're mocking him because they don't know Tim Scott is always that way. He's always emotional, passionate, reverend like when he speaks, when he's when he was on the campaign trail. So they're mocking him. A, a black man. And yet Joy Reid and her ilk are the lowest of the low lives. They're America's bigots, but they save their hate for Tim Scott. This segment of the podcast is exclusively sponsored by Pure Talk. Pure Talk offers great coverage and can save your family money on your wireless bill every single month. Go to puretalk.com to find the plan that's right for you. Thank you again for listening, and thank you so much for this sponsorship, Pure Talk. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. It's really not that bad, to be perfectly honest with you. Trump was asked to buy Taiwan by Maria Bartiromo on Sunday Morning Futures, and she's fantastic, by the way. She's terrific. Powerhouse. And... Um, the former president, they say, declined to give a firm answer whether we would defend Taiwan. And I got to thinking during the break, this is what he does, though. This is what he does. I know he will defend Taiwan. Can't tell you how I know, but I know. Just like he took out Soleimani. Just like he put his foot on the throat of Iran. Donald Trump is not an isolationist. He's not a pacifist. He wants victory. But he wants victory if he can avoid war. Joe Biden is the opposite. He sends our troops into war zones, and he doesn't want victory. And this is what the American people and I are sick of. Now, I disagree with some of the Republican Party that don't think we should be aiding Ukraine. But that doesn't mean a blank check. Almost none of the money that we give to Ukraine leaves the country. It goes to the Defense Department. They have an account for Ukraine as they do other countries. And they use that money here at home, hiring American citizens to build the ammunition and so forth, the weaponry that they need. There is no military industrial type factories in Ukraine any more than there are in Israel. So we're basically spending our own money on munitions uh, to provide for our allies who are outgunned or surrounded. But the way in which Biden has done it in Ukraine, where he doesn't want them to win, of course, has caused hellish, hellish conditions, particularly in Ukraine. And so people keep dying. People keep dying. There's a stalemate. He didn't give them the weapons that they needed as soon as they needed them. And so I think this is why so many of you have turned sour on this, because it's Biden again. I understand that. But I also have a different view in this respect. Russia cannot win, or it'll be a massive loss for the United States. And it could draw us into World War III, because the NATO triggers can be pulled if Russia moves into Romania, Poland, the Balkan states, and then beyond. We've seen this before. People say it can't happen. Folks, It happened less than 100 years ago. 
So his comment on Taiwan is, in many respects, what Trump does. He creates an ambiguity. Now, that can be dangerous. That could be brilliant, depending on the situation. But I remind myself, this is the man who built up the United States military. This is the man who built up the United States Navy, only to have all of this undermined, of course, by Biden and his Democrats. This is a man who did draw red lines with communist China and Russia and so forth. But he did it in a way that didn't promote war. And so I, for one... I, for one, as I rethink this during the break, I, for one, am not prepared to condemn his approach, even though I will criticize it from time to time, but his overall approach, depending on the situation. It's not an isolationist approach. It's not a passive approach. That's not who he is even though the isolationists and pacifists in both parties try to project their dangerous ideology onto Trump, it's not Trump's ideology. I've talked to him. It's simply not. Now, we have Joe Biden. And I said before, his ideology is defeatism. His ideology is to surrender it. It's worse than appeasement. He's actually arming our enemies. He's actually arming our enemies. And I think if Donald Trump were president and our soldiers are coming under attack from the Houthis or anybody else, he would respond with overwhelming power. America first. Those are Americans. America first means Americans first. You're shooting at, trying to kill American soldiers. Donald Trump loves this country. He will defend those soldiers. He always has. Not Biden. Now, creating ambiguity with respect to Taiwan could be a dangerous gambit, in my view. But we'll see. I don't think he deserves the vicious attacks that he's receiving from the usual corners. In fact, I want to read this to you. That has not really been highlighted when it comes to that part of the world. And this was written by Nikkei Asia. I know nothing about it, and I don't need to. But this was written a few days back. The prospect of having former U.S. President Donald Trump and Taiwan President-elect Li Jingti, he's the more conservative of the candidates who were running in, tai, uh, in uh, Taiwan, having them in office at the same time as leaving China scrambling to rethink strategies, said an analyst. Beijing's real nightmare scenario is not necessarily watching Li Jingti, Taiwan's new president, winning the election, but it's the combination of him and perhaps Donald Trump coming back into the White House. They fear Donald Trump. They respect Donald Trump the way they feared Reagan and respected Reagan. And so in the case of Trump, this piece was written a few days before he made the comment on Taiwan, which I don't think is ultra provocative, actually. Again, as I'm thinking this through out loud with you. He knows Xi... He dealt with him for four years. He believes he knows how to deal with this situation. And I believe he knows that allowing China to militarily conquer Taiwan while the United States sits back is something he does not want to happen on his watch. He has said as much. Not on my watch. And despite what people project onto Donald Trump, he's never said he wouldn't help Ukraine. He said that the invasion of Ukraine never would have happened. And he's right. 
because the surrender in Afghanistan would never have happened. And he's right. Remember what he said about the head of the Taliban? What he told him? I know where you live. Trump has his ways. They're just unconventional. But he also believes in what Reagan said, peace through strength. So I'm not worried about that. I don't believe he's going to surrender allies to our enemies. And you know, the funny thing is, that's what Biden is doing. Oh, he supports our allies. We're back. He wants the world to know we're back. Well, tell the Israeli leadership about that. Tell the Ukrainian leadership about that. The Taiwanese leadership is scared to death of Biden. They don't believe he will have their back despite all the posturing. So in other words, in reality, it's Biden. Who does does the minimal. So he can say, look at what I'm doing. But has no intention. Once an enemy attacks of defeating the enemy. No intention whatsoever. So it leads to horror stories. Absolute terrible horror stories. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Does social engineering from leftist corporations make you feel like we're living in the twilight zone? Well, you're not alone. Pure Talk, my wireless company, knows the silent majority is fed up. And I urge all those Americans to stand with a company that champions your values. Those of you who always have your neighbors back, who pulled yourselves up by your bootstraps, who realize that a little bit of elbow grease can fix just about anything. Well, it's time to join your fellow patriots who fled their old wireless company for something better. Pure Talk. Pure Talk gives you phenomenal coverage on America's most dependable 5G network for half the price of the other guys. And with unlimited plans starting at just $20 a month, the average family saves almost $1,000 a year. And it's a veteran-owned company. Pure Talk is a company you can feel proud to do business with. Just go to puretalk.com slash Levin to join your fellow Americans and make the switch. That's puretalk.com slash Levin and save an additional 50% off your first month with Pure Talk. Here's Jake Tapper on CNN yesterday. I play him because most people don't know who he is other than because of this program or watch him. He's gotten increasingly um, unhinged. He's out of the closet as a leftist now. Um, he, he understands that that's, that's his bread and butter. That's his grift. And so he's there. I want you to know that Jake Tapper once again cut off Donald Trump's speech. Because they, Jake Tapper does not believe in free speech. He just believes in his speech. Jake Tapper would be a perfect anchor. For Russian state TV, for Iran state TV, especially for Hamas, I can tell you that. Perfect. Because he doesn't want to hear this, this uh, you know, this Donald Trump. And so. Truthfully, the media in our country is filled with more low lives than ever before. Even when Reagan ran. More low lives than ever before. And they're proud of it. They're self-righteous. They're self-aggrandizing. They're grifters. It's what they are. I'll prove it to you. Here's Jake Tapper on CNN yesterday about Trump's speech. And I want to remind you, somebody told me media is very upset about it. You know, they can all go to hell. The pre low IQ pukes over there. Dan Abrams crowd. But as long as they get accurate what I say. I don't really care. From time to time, I will post what Media Matters says because they think it's awful. I think it's great. So I will link to it. The Mediaites actually even worse because of their pretentiousness. Hey, you want to hear about the Media 100? No, not really. I create my own list. And I'm at the top. So why would I look at yours? Anyway, Nikki Haley's speech was classless. It was dishonest. It was a play to the media who back her for now. An attempt to spin what took place. 
she lost, and she lost resoundingly. And when you look at the numbers and go behind the numbers, she lost really, really badly. She got 28% of the Republican vote, America. And Donald Trump actually got a significant percentage of the voters, enough of them, who came in, um, you know, who weren't Republicans. Significant enough. And she times her speech to try and put the spin out there. And it was, in my view, very disrespectful. I said this the other day. And it really was uh, the sort of thing she's been doing to the other candidates with the nasty lies and the attacks. At least three other candidates are on the state. That's why none of them endorsed her. Plus, she's, she's gone hard left. She makes Susan Collins look like uh, the George Patton of conservatism. And by the way, there is a little look there with Susan, kind of a little bit George Patton. But anyway, I want to finish this when I come back because all the, all the analysis is what Trump said. Trump was replying to what was a classless statement by a loser, Haley. Does social engineering from leftist corporations make you feel like we're living in the twilight zone? Well, you're not alone. Pure Talk, my wireless company, knows the silent majority is fed up. And I urge all those Americans to stand with a company that champions your values. Those of you who always have your neighbors back, who pulled yourselves up by your bootstraps, who realize that a little bit of elbow grease can fix just about anything. Well, it's time to join your fellow patriots who fled their old wireless company for something better. Pure Talk. Pure Talk gives you phenomenal coverage on America's most dependable 5G network for half the price of the other guys. And with unlimited plans starting at just $20 a month, the average family saves almost $1,000 a year. And it's a veteran-owned company. Pure Talk is a company you can feel proud to do business with. Just go to puretalk.com slash Levin to join your fellow Americans and make the switch. That's puretalk.com slash Levin and save an additional 50% off your first month with Pure Talk. Mark Levin, the research arm of conservative media. Call in now, 877-381-3811. All right. Okay. Fake Jake Tap out Tapper. Now, why does he have such a platform on CNN? Well, the answer is simple. Probably nobody else would take it. I mean, CNN doesn't have any viewers, doesn't have any ratings. And so the old question is, if a tree falls in the forest, Mr. Producer, and you don't hear it fall, has it actually fallen? You don't see it fall, has it actually fallen? Well, the same applies to hosts on MSNBC and CNN. Are they actually hosts if nobody watches them? Are they actually hosts if nobody can hear them? Well, it's a good question. But I use them as sort of uh, knockdown puppets because I use them to make a point. And by the way, by their own words, they expose themselves. It's not a pretty sight. So here's Jake fake tap out on CNN yesterday who would not carry the entirety of Trump's speech because he dared to ask Ramaswamy to speak. This is a new thing. This is a new form of censorship. The lowest rated carbon footprints in media, CNN and MSNBC are doing this a lot. But even MSNBC wouldn't do it last night. That is, MSNBC did not cut off Trump's speech. CNN and Tapper did. They're supposed to be a news organization. And so my question is, really, for which country? Certainly not ours. News organization that is a mouthpiece for Hamas. Hamas. Wait until you see what I do this weekend on Life, Liberty, and Levin. Wait until you see what I do. You got to watch both shows. I'm not playing games. Wait until you see. I don't even want to convey it because here's what happens. When I tell you what guests I'm going to have, they're poached. When I tell you what subject I'm going to discuss, that's poached. Now, I do understand that my show is different. And I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the whole world of weekend TV. So I have what's called a conundrum. 
Do I tell you who's coming on or what I want to talk about, or do I not? Some weeks I do, some weeks I don't. So typically I'll wait till a Thursday or a Friday if I need to to tell you. It's really amazing. Remember Trump? It's Trump. Remember uh, Rush used to do these uh, these audios, and he used to put in there some kind of a filter, so you could hear that it was actually him saying it and him saying it first, because he and I used to talk about this. We were extremely, extremely close, closer than people even know that I've ever discussed or that he ever discussed. And I miss him as a friend. I miss him at night texting him before he had his uh, hearing issues, talking to him over the phone. I really do. And the country misses him, too. That said, in fact, I think his birthday's coming up. So anyway, uh, it used to annoy the hell out of him. But he was be- much better at uh, camouflaging his annoyance than I am, Mr. Producer, if you notice. Although he did, he said, I've had enough. So he did use this filter system so you would know it's him. Um, we have the same problem here. But I don't have a filter system. I don't have a staff of 13 people. It is what it is. But here's Jake Tapper. He cuts off Trump's speech. Just like a good little fascist would. I'm not saying he's a fascist. In fact, I think he's more Marxist. But just like a good little fascist. Or Marxist would for that matter. Check this out. And check out what he has to say about it. Cut four, go. Uh, and Aaron, I think, you know, one of the things that's uh, interesting about uh, Donald Trump's performance this evening and what's is... what's interesting to me, first of all, and quite frankly, it's everywhere, is when reporters interview reporters. Isn't that something, Mr. Producer? And hosts interview hosts. Well, Mark, everybody... Okay, I'm pointing it out. It's, it just cracks me up. Whether it's in somebody's backyard or my own back, it cracks me up. It's Okay. It's not a criticism. I just laugh. All right, go ahead. He's angry. That was not a celebratory Trump. He's angry that Nikki Haley is still in the race. Look here, look. He's angry. It's not celebratory. He's angry. Aaron. He's angry that she's still in the race. No comment about what she said or how she said it or what she did. Nothing. Classless, lousy, nasty speech an attempt to deceive her supporters, her donors, into thinking that she won something when she lost everything. It's down to a two-man race. I got rid of all the other gents. Just one gent left. One gent. Even when I came in third, I came in first. Even when I come in second, I come in first. The problem is... The Jake Tappers and Aaron, whoever that is, Burnett, I I don't know what's sitting there. They think we're stupid. Now, we're not stupid because, first of all, we don't watch CNN. Stupid watches CNN. We play these clips to make points. And the point is they're stupid. And the point is they're propagandists. Go ahead. Insulting her, he was insulting voters of New Hampshire. He was insulting the the process uh, no, of the. No, pro- no, you know you're such a you know what. Can't say it on the air. Could say it on the podcast, but can't say it here. It wasn't insulting. He was telling the truth. He didn't insult the voters of New Hampshire. You jerk. You moron. Like you insult your audience every damn day. So worried about Trump insulting. How come you never cover Biden? Where was Biden last night? Oh, giving a speech in Virginia. How come he took his name off the ballot? Isn't that voter suppression? That's not democracy, is it, Jake? Shouldn't that be your focus? Shouldn't your focus be, I wonder why Trump reacted the way he did? Well, what did Nikki Haley say? That would cause any candidate to be annoyed. And yet Donald Trump did it. Responded, and I think he responded the right way. And I don't always, but I sure as hell think he was there because when Nikki Haley finished, honestly, I said to myself, what the kind, what the hell kind of outrageously nasty, dishonest speech was that? 
And all the operatives, you know, they tell you, you need to go first. You need to define the, the reality. You need to create the reality. You need to create the narrative. For clowns like Jake Tapper. Jake Tapper, I hope you watch my shows on the weekend. Because I'm going to mention you among others. Ooh. Because you're giving aid and comfort to terrorists. Oh, yes, you are, Jake. Yes, you are. And so are others. And I'm going to prove it to you. Isn't that going to be cool, Mr. Producer? It won't just be my word. Oh, man, I can barely keep my mouth shut over this. But anyway, here I am. Go ahead. System there, which has been going on for... I right, shut back. up, idiot. You know, we really are sick of you, which is why you have no audience. None. It's always hate Trump. It's cut off Trump. Trump's the provocateur. Trump doesn't know how to behave. Trump this, Trump that. This is all you're going to get from these clowns. Oh, I was going to mention my buddy Stephen A. Smith, and he is my buddy. We don't always agree. I don't even know where he stands on everything. Uh, it doesn't matter. But I think, didn't he announce he wants to debate Trump, Mr. Producer? Did I see that somewhere? Well, I want to debate LeBron James. So I think Stephen A. Smith has as much chance of debating Donald Trump, who obviously isn't in sports, as I do of LeBron James, who obviously is in Stephen A.'s world. I'd love to debate LeBron James about his civil rights views and record with China, about his hypocrisy, how he lives, and yet he trashes the capitalist system. How he's protected by security and bodyguards, but really is attacking the cops about systemic racism. I would love to have that debate with LeBron. I'd love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. But it'll never happen. So I never brought it up. Why bring it up? So I love Stephen A., but he's not going to be able to debate Donald Trump. No, I will debate any, anybody on ESPN. Anybody. There's smart people on ESPN. I mean, you got a lot of rain men and rain women there. They look, throw the statistics. Oh, this guy in 1983. He, uh, I'm going, what, how the hell do these people know all this stuff? You got to be smart to remember this stuff. Oh, and then he did a, uh, you know, he did a, uh, he ran out into the flat and he threw the ball and he was supposed to do this, supposed to do that. I find it fascinating when I can watch it because I'm working, but when I can watch it. And there's, I mean, you got to be smart to remember all this stuff, this history. In fact, I think Stephen A. is the rain man of sports. And that's a compliment. Somebody, you're the rain man of the Constitution. I say, thank you. Just means you're like uh, super knowledgeable about this stuff. It comes right off your lips. That's him. That's him. But if Donald Trump's not going to debate these other people, why would he debate Stephen A. Smith? I have a better case to make for LeBron debating me. For LeBron debate, we're not running for anything. We're not running for anything. I'm sure LeBron thinks he's smarter than I am, he's wiser than I am, that I'm a right-wing nut or something like that. So, okay. And so he gets the handicapping. That is, he gets the betters, the betters, B-E-T-T-E-R, the betters support. I'm just a little little radio host. What do I know? What do I know? So I'll do this. I challenged LeBron James to a debate. Okay, great. Let's move on. I'd love nothing. Look, I've challenged Bernie Sanders to debates. He won't even come on radio or TV. He's a coward. I've challenged Chris Christie. Same thing. I've challenged Romney. Same thing. We even challenged, uh, what's that? Commie's name that I keep bringing up, Mr. Producer. What's his name? Raskin. Mr. Constitution. No, he's Mr. Anti-Constitution. He won't come on. Who else have we invited who won't come on? None of them will come on. Nikki Haley, we had invited her to come on. Nope. Nope, she won't come on. There you have it. And it's just a little old me. I'm just a radio host. What, what do I know? What the hell do I know? But I'm happy to debate any of them, all of them, at ESPN. Or as like we call it, ESPN. 
Ispen. I will debate anybody at Ispen. Not about sports. For God's sakes, they'll kick my ass. I got that. I don't pretend. You know, I do have this thought, though, Mr. Producer. Wouldn't it be cool for one show if I was on one of these shows just sitting in the chair there? <laughs> like on Stephen A's. Just give me an extra chair. So, And by the way, these sports guys, most of them are big dudes. They could s- squeeze your head like a grape. So you do need to behave yourself. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Does social engineering from leftist corporations make you feel like we're living in the twilight zone? Well, you're not alone. Pure Talk, my wireless company, knows the silent majority is fed up. And I urge all those Americans to stand with a company that champions your values. Those of you who always have your neighbors back, who pulled yourselves up by your bootstraps, who realize that a little bit of elbow grease can fix just about anything. Well, it's time to join your fellow patriots who fled their old wireless company for something better. Pure Talk. Pure Talk gives you phenomenal coverage on America's most dependable 5G network for half the price of the other guys. And with unlimited plans starting at just $20 a month, the average family saves almost $1,000 a year. And it's a veteran-owned company. Pure Talk is a company you can feel proud to do business with. Just go to puretalk.com slash Levin to join your fellow Americans and make the switch. That's puretalk.com slash Levin and save an additional 50% off your first month with Pure Talk. Just for the record, I want to make it clear that the Mark Levin decision, decision room, which consists of three of us, me, myself, and I, Uh, We uh, announced that Donald Trump had won New Hampshire before all the other decision rooms or what do they call them? Decision groups or whatever. It was just so obvious. It was so obvious that she had no way to win. Now she's going to skip Nevada because she'll get cream there. You can't run in a Republican primary and skip states like this and try and create an impression. And she's going to be in her home state in South Carolina. Can I give some friendly advice to Nikki, who's a dear friend, as you well know, Mr. Producer? I don't know her. Uh, Get out before South Carolina, or you will destroy yourself. Now, like I said, as a dear friend, I would recommend that. But if she doesn't want to, that's up to her. We have a very powerful third hour, and I'll be right back. He's here. He's here. Now broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Very important, our third hour. 877-381-3811. We hope to take some calls before we're done. 877-381-3811. Now, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, some people collect stamps. Some people collect coins. Some people collect sexual diseases. Did you know that, Mr. Producer? Now, that said, we collect mumblers. And in each case, it's either a Democrat in the media or a Democrat politician who's not in the media. So, can be a Democrat who's from Hollywood, doesn't much matter. They're all Democrats. And so we collect, over the years, we've collected the mumblers. So I want you to listen to this, because I think we need to extend our list of mumblers. Adding yet again... Nancy Stretch Pelosi, some people who are not familiar, I call her Stretch because it's obvious she's had an inordinate number of facelifts. And so there must be like a huge staple in the back of her head where all her skin is. It's a very unpleasant thought, but nonetheless, no more unpleasant than that photo on the beach where she was walking with her daughter. Remember that one, Mr. Producer? It's like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's too much information. Too much info. It's like that photo of uh, Ted Kennedy on the boat. Remember him? Oh, my God. Anyway, 
or a typical photo of Chris Christie, I might add. Here's Nancy Pelosi on MSLSD yesterday. I think you'll enjoy. Cut 10, go. Let me just say I'm not going to spend too much time on Donald Trump's uh, cognitive disorders. But I, what I am going to say, and I want to, in friendship, say to Chris, he tried to say that Nikki Haley did not allow the National Guard to come, but it was Nancy Pelosi. It was need, nobody. It was Joe. It was Donald Trump. He knows and you know that Mitch McConnell, Chuck Schumer and I begged for hours for the National Guard to come. He knows that we don't have the party to bring the National Guard. The president does. Sad to say for the District of Columbia, because every other state, the governor has that power. All right. All right. She's rambling. She got Trump's name wrong. And they don't have the party. I think she meant power to bring the National Guard. And of course, she's a liar in all languages, including gibberish. And she made a fortune as a member of Congress and as Speaker of the House. A fortune, a fortune she made that was bigger than any typical average portfolio would make. Because when you're the Speaker, you decide what comes up for a vote. And she was asked about this by no less than 60 minutes some years ago. But of course, they dropped it. No grand jury, no Washington investigation, no calls for investigation. Because it's Nancy. Nancy Pelosi. So that's Nancy Pelosi. As best as we can tell. I want to get to another subject. This is very important. There's a little dot on the map in the middle of the Middle East. It's called Qatar. People have changed their pronunciations of Qatar. Like Kiev is now Kiev. Ooh. So smart. It's still Qatar to me. And Qatar is a dangerous little terrorist monarchy run by an inbred. When they hand their countries down, you know, from one to the next, like they do family members. That's Qatar. Qatar is a little speck on the map, which is fine. There are specks. But it happens to have a ton of oil. A ton of oil under its ground. And as you know, by listening to this show and watching me on Levin TV and Fox, I did the most thorough analysis of what's happening in our colleges and universities with foreign money of anybody. Qatar is second only to communist China in the billions and billions of dollars that they pour into our colleges and universities to turn out pro-Hamas terrorist activists, protesters, to turn out anti-Semites. Qatar, as you know, works very closely with the Islamo-Nazi regime in Tehran. Qatar works very closely with the Islamo-Nazi regime in Turkey. Qatar funds Hamas. Qatar supports terrorist organizations. Al Jazeera is owned by, funded by Qatar. I didn't say guitar, Qatar. Meanwhile, Joe Biden extends for 10 years a military base we have in Qatar which the genius George W. Bush put there in the first place. And his genius Secretary of State, James Baker. So they extended for 10 years without any conditions whatsoever. Like, how about you turn over those Hitler monsters that you're protecting? Those billionaires who run Hamas. No requests. In fact... This administration relies on terrorists and funds terrorists and terrorist regimes. And they have anointed Qatar the way they anointed Russia to negotiate our nuclear deal with Iran. Sick, insane. They've done the same with Qatar to negotiate with Hamas to release the hostages. 
wait a minute, didn't you just say Qatar funds some? Yes, I did. And works with Iran? Yes, I did. Didn't you say, just say Qatar is buying the minds and souls of our college students all over the country? Yes, I did. But that's not the only thing Qatar has purchased with its oil money. Politicians, special interests, lobbyists in Washington, D.C., both parties. Qatar has bought senators and congressmen who retire or want to retire. And Qatar is there with suitcases, if you will, full of cash. Members of Congress today rarely ever condemn Qatar. And even if they have some level of condemnation, they don't pursue it. There's been no hearing in the Senate or the House to investigate where Qatar has spent its money in the United States because you'd have to put crime tape around the Capitol building. Qatar has enormous influence in the White House. Enormous influence. It buys its way in and out of one situation or another. Tell me, who is the leading voice in the Senate or the House demanding a full investigation into the country of Qatar? I don't know of any. Now, there could be one or two. I'm just saying, I don't know of any. Are they subpoenaing any records? Are they conducting any depositions? Nothing. And you look what Qatar is doing to our country into the state of Israel, into the Middle East generally. Why would we rely on them for a military base? Why would we rely on them to negotiate hostages and the release? Why would we do that? Because Joe Biden is suicidal and he wants to drag the rest of us into his hell. That's one of the reasons. And here's a piece in the Jerusalem Post, which used to be a pretty good paper, not so much anymore, but nonetheless. Qatar appalled that Netanyahu called them problematic mediators. So there's Netanyahu having a private discussion with some of the hostage families. Somebody is running an iPhone or some other form of recording, unbeknownst to him. And he had the temerity, the gall to call Qatar and their role as, quote, problematic mediators. They're problematic mediators. And one of the inbreds at Qatar, Foreign Minister Spokesman Yabadabadu, he was offended. The terrorist regime in Qatar that plays both sides, he was offended by such a obvious... Obvious fact. We are appalled. Of course, he did in broken English. We are appalled by alleged remarks attributed to the Israeli prime minister in various media reports about Qatar's mediation role, said Qatar foreign minister Yabadabadu. These remarks have validated are irresponsible and destructive in the efforts to save innocent lives, but are not surprising. Now, these bastards, these SOBs, have funded the people who took those hostages. They have funded the people who slaughtered the Jews. They are protecting their billionaire leaders who are calling the shots from some five-star Western-built hotel. Qatar. Qatar, they have tennis tournaments. They have golf tournaments. They have all kinds of cool things going on. People are, oh, look at this. Tennis players from So the athletes don't say a word. The athletes... And their leagues don't say a word. People who want their kids to become professional tennis they don't say a word. Nothing. So Netanyahu is undermining, you see, the, the mediation. It's Netanyahu. Well, why wouldn't they say Netanyahu? Thomas Friedman says it. Right? Blinken, Biden, our own 
Marxist, pro-Islamist, Bernie Sanders, he says it, they all say it. So it's Netanyahu's fault, just like in our country, everything is Trump's fault. Biden's funding the enemy, terrorists. He's rearming the enemy, they're shooting those weapons at us. They've killed Jews, Israelis, with those weapons, with these terrorist groups, and it's Israel's fault. It's Israel's fault that 80% of the Palestinian people, the citizens, the peaceful people, would vote for Hamas next time. So it's Israel's fault that they won't capitulate and give 30% of their country, Judea and Samaria, to the very people who want to destroy them. Come on now. Again, watch this week, and you're not going to believe the tape that I have. That's right. I have a videotape. I have a videotape. As they say on ESPN, go to the videotape. I actually think I could do ESPN. Don't you, Mr. Producer? Go to the videotape. There you go. Go to the videotape. George Michael used to say that in Washington, great sports coach. All right. So this is Qatar. They're funding Islamicism in our country. They're funding anti-Semitism in our country. They have their hooks into our colleges and universities. They have their hooks into Capitol Hill. They have their hooks into the executive branch. Both parties. Both parties. And nobody in Congress is saying, let's have a hearing, let's investigate. Who exactly is on their payroll? Through law firms, through lobbying firms, government officials, former government officials, think tanks. They're spreading their money everywhere, and it's having an enormous impact on our country. But these bastards aren't fooling me or anybody else who loves America. These bastards aren't fooling any of us. No, they're negotiating for the release of the hostages when they funded the very, the very monsters who kidnapped those people. And Joe Biden just extends for 10 years the base without getting anything for it from these, from these inbreds. Nothing. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. America, 330 million people, many of whom are just fantastic. And Van Jones, a Marxist in and of himself, recommends that Joe Biden campaign again for president from the basement. Now, ladies and gentlemen, how much longer are we going to put up with the Democrat Party in this bullcrap? He's destroying the country. Our enemies are poised to attack. Some of them have. It's, it's, just, it's just outrageous with the Democrat. But the Democrat Party would support a kumquat for president. It doesn't matter. And here's Biden and an event in Virginia. They're running on abortion. They're obsessed with abortion. And I keep saying, well, then show us an abortion. Particularly in the last three months, show it to us. You got big screens. Put it on one of those 30-foot screens there so everybody can see what it is that's safe what it, is, what it means to have a choice, what's not a human being. What are you afraid of? It's safe. That's what they tell us. Show us. We all want to see it. Cut 14. Here's the genius. Go. Hello, Virginia. <laughs> and the real governor, Terry McCullough. What are you saying? Oh, an election denier. Huh. So Peter Ducey asked Jean-Pierre Idiot, what about this? Cut 15, go. Is election denying a joke now? What do you mean you have to say more than just make a random statement? <laughs> Why did the president say, hello, Virginia, and the real governor, Terry McCall? <clears throat> he was making a joke about Terry. He was making a joke. joke. That's his he point, was- you idiot. Go ahead. Play it back. It's clearly that the president was making a joke. What's the joke? He was making a joke about McCullough's previous term as governor. How are you guys going to convince people, though, uh, that this idea of denying election results is very bad if President Biden is going out and making jokes like this? Okay, he did not deny. He did not deny it. He congratulated Governor Youngkin. Matter of fact, uh, when he won his election, he did it out of the gate. Out of the gate. Really, truly. He, uh, he congratulated the governor. And not only that, 
We've had opportunities to work closely with the governor in, over the past couple of years. And, uh, you know, this is a president. All right, that shut works. up, you propagandists. Enough is enough with this, this crowd. These mouthpieces in this administration, and those are the paid for from the government payroll and then the rest of the media. See, Biden can do no wrong. He doesn't mumble. His brain is unbelievably he's as sharp as ever before. Just ask him on MSNBC. He's a remarkable man, this man. His incredible accomplishments. Uh, and by that they mean uh, all the government that he's imposed on us and pushed into our lives. Oh, yes, it's tremendous accomplishments. You just don't know it. You're too stupid. We're not explaining it properly. This is what they say. You're living it. No, no, you're not. Ex- you're not you're, you don't understand. Oh, okay, tell me. They lord over us. They talk down to us. And Biden, honestly, he should be in a home right now. I'm not kidding. This is not making jokes of somebody who has dementia. He's in stage five of stage seven of dementia. We should not have a president like this. This is what the 25th Amendment was was written for, to deal with something like this, not to elect somebody like this. Not to elect somebody like this. He wants to talk about democracy and freedom. Democracy and freedom? I want to talk about having the basic everyday skills to go to work every day and not even as president. You know, at the fryer at McDonald's. I'll be right back. Mark Levin, making conservatism great again. Dial in now, 877-381-3811. I said we'll take some calls, and let's take some calls. Let's go to Wendy. New York on Long Island, the great WABC. Wendy, how are you today? I'm doing good. Thanks so much for taking my call. Of um, course. I was listening to you talk about um, the, how our politicians are being bribed by Qatar. So not only are there not only are the politicians' minds being taken, but the minds of the kids in the elementary school in New York City and Brooklyn are also being purchased. And here's how it's happening. Um, I'm going to refer you to an article in the Free Press that is Barry Weiss's new Internet News letter. And there's an article in there on January 11th, which spoke about the erasure of Israel. So in some various elementary schools in Brooklyn, Qatar has donated over a million dollars over X number of years. And a teacher in the school had noticed that there was a map in the art room, which had shown all of the Arabic countries in the Middle East, which is basically every country except for Israel. And what was in Israel's place was Palestine. Mm. So the defense of this map was, well, we're just showing a map of countries in the Middle East that represent Arab culture and that speak Arabic. Well, hello, 20% of Israel speaks Arabic and they Mm -hmm. have a very strong culture, Arabic culture, from what I've seen when I've been there. So um, they were told, so they took it down. It was actually posted on X. And um, I'm not going to have ma- a ton of time, so how does this relate to Qatar? Go ahead. Because Qatar is funding this money through nonprofit organizations. So people need to understand this, that a foreign government that is hostile to the United States, that is funding our enemies, that is an alliance with Iran and Hamas, and quite frankly Turkey, which is another Islamo-Nazi regime, is now you're saying they're in our elementary schools. Yes, they are. And the only way that we can change things like this is by voting, voting for people who will help, you know, support Israel and our democracy. And America. Because if America goes, Israel goes. So uh, you're quite right. And I've always said, if you hate America, you hate Israel. If you hate Israel, you hate America. And it's proving out each and every day, isn't it, Wendy? Yes, it is, sadly. Thank you. Very intelligent. Very important call. We appreciate it. Let's see. uh, Let's go to, I'm just looking here. Let's go to Jane, Saratoga, New York, the great WGDJ. Hello, Jane. Go right ahead. Hi, Hi, Mr. Levin. I just want to point this out. I was reading an article. Um, Before the October 7th massacre, um, Biden made a purchase um, eight hundred and fifty eight billion dollars in a defense appropriation it's called the Catagon Act now, having 
you know, being a retired abuse counselor, that catagon is a very extreme amphetamine. And they have started giving it to their soldiers. And it will make a soldier... Hamas just, has. Uh, yeah, Hamas is now importing this drug, mm-hmm. giving it mm-hmm. to their soldiers. Yeah, and, it puts them on a uh, high, and it makes them like they feel superhuman, and they do things that are... Um, they act very aggressively. They're, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, no, so, yeah, so... Um, they started giving it to the Hamas soldiers in training camp before the October 7th slaughter. Yes, they did. You're right. What does Biden have to do with that? He made the first purchase and started selling it to people. He spent $858 billion on called the Catagon Act and started selling it first to people. I'm going to have to look into that. Let me check that out. So I, I'm, not, I'm quite ignorant at this point. So let me check that out, okay? Very interesting. And yeah. certainly not above what he would do. So. All right, Jane. Thank you for your call. Let us continue. We're on a roll. Glenn, Evans, Georgia, Sirius Satellite. Glenn, how are you, sir? Yeah, hi. Very well, Mark. Thank you. Um, you I, I suspect you'll know this off the top of your head, but if, if not, I, I would ask that you look into it. I suspect yes. that most citizens believe that when a foreigner uh, or an illegal alien uh, reproduces in this country, that that baby is inherently a citizen of the country. And I, no, I don't no. think it, it's not supposed. It, look, I don't read. I know your point. Your point is that's the way it's treated. The individual who's born. But the Constitution in no way compels that. In fact, I really didn't start till sometime around the half century or so, give or take. And nobody knows how it started. The theory is that the Social Security Administration, this is serious, I've looked into this, uh, just for the purpose of making things easier bureaucratically, would do that, would announce that they're citizens and so forth. But there's never really been... A, a certainly the Constitution hasn't been amended. Certainly um, there wasn't an act of Congress that did this. Now, the courts uphold it and somehow it has secreted its way into our system, which is so preposterous. And I wrote about this way back on a chapter in immigration and liberty and tyranny, that it is so ridiculous. So if you have people living in this country who are foreign diplomats And they have a child in one of our hospitals that that child is now an American citizen. Most of those foreign diplomats don't view it that way. It's ridiculous. And the other problem is, more fundamental problem is, people don't get to create citizenship on their own by claiming jurisdiction. So, really, the idea that people come across the border and have a child and thereby create the jurisdiction and the supposed circumstances for having a child that's an American citizen is absurd. And look at how these things become law and constitutionalized in our system. This is the problem. You go ahead. Well, I mean, I know that's the treatment, and and, I, and thank you for, for clarifying that, that that's not how it, how it ought to be, or the Constitution doesn't mandate that. Yes. But since it's been treated that way for quite a, a long time, does it de fact become the de facto law? Because no, that's, it shouldn't. You know, I mean, it is, but it shouldn't. I mean, slavery existed for a long time. That shouldn't be de facto either. The Constitution is the Constitution. The rule of law is the rule of law. The same people who want to shred the Constitution and claim that it's the document of a white racist dominant society are the same people who take the Constitution, turn it inside out, and pretend it does what they want it to do. And so there's simply no real constitutional basis for this, even though slip and fall, ambulance chasing, phony, poison Ivy League lawyers who are professors will pretend That it is. Thank you for your call, my friend. Let's take another. Let's go to Rodney, Virginia Beach, Virginia, the great WMAL, WMAL. How are you, Rodney? I'm doing fine. Thanks. Thanks for taking my call. I called about a year or so ago and you invited me back, and I'm grateful for that. Took you a long time, Rodney, but then again, I don't take a lot of calls. So go right ahead, my friend. Well, I'm I'm an African-American U.S. world history teacher, 
Mm-hmm. And I'm also an author. And my first question is this. We'd like to have you as part of a documentary that a, uh, a Hollywood producer wants to make out of out of my book. And because you're so knowledgeable... Well, we have to take this off air. I've never done that before, but I'm going to have to get information from you with my producer. Okay. okay. I can't hear him, Rich. Well, the, the question... Go ahead. I go on with the question... Uh, this is a year, 2024, and I, I've been talking about this with some of my students. You know, there's going to be 64 elections around the world. Almost a half a, half of the world's population is going to be affected by elections this year. And in light of that, we wanted to ask, how do you think would be best for the Republican Party to capitalize on this, show hegemony, and offer the best solution because it's going to be a type of let me let me just say this to you because we're running out of time i have to take a break they can't even do it in our own country how are we going to do it outside our country yeah they're at each other's throats we're fighting amongst ourselves while the democrats are destroying the country and all i'm saying i'm just saying is thinking about creating some like super umbrella movement and so forth and so on. It's a fascinating thought. It's not going to happen. Um, and in most of these European countries, quite frankly, most of them are gone too. So at least as, as an experiment, let's try and get our country back. And if we succeed in getting our footing, I think then we can think about uh, how we organize an international movement. Um, like that. I mean, as long as you have a guy like Mitch McConnell or people like this, uh, we have a big problem here at home. We're losing our country. We've, we're losing the Republican Party. The Republican Party was founded in the 1850s for one reason, on one principle, to end slavery. And that was worth fighting for. And keeping our country together, that's worth fighting for. Apparently, nothing's worth fighting for today. Nothing. Thank you for your call, my friend. Excellent, excellent call. All the calls have been great. We'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Let's go to Steve, South Florida. Sirius Satellite. Steve, how are you, sir? How are you doing, Mark? Nice to finally meet you. You too. So, uh, you know, so I've never been, uh, I'm going to try to be quick as I can. Um, I've never been compelled. Well, you know what uh, Mo Howard said on the uh, Three Stooges, correct? Take your time, but hurry up. Yeah. <laughs> I actually remember that. <laughs> I'm 33. <laughs> I know, but every now, now and then I'm in fifth grade. Anyway, go right ahead. Yeah. No. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a believer, and I just recently, the past few days, I've had something unbelievable happen, you know, and I think only believers and Christians can... can well, tell us what happened before we have to hang up. Um, I just want... I just I have a question. Like, have you ever thought of the biblical or God side of all of this? Every the day. The good, the evil. I'm sure you've thought about it. I know. Every I know. Day. I've thought about it. It's just... I, people tiptoe around Christianity and religion. You don't, but you look. I'm not even Christian, and I think I know more about Christianity than half the people in this country. And I'll tell you one other thing. I thank the people in this country, and I do it often. The vast majority, the overwhelming majority of whom founded this country and were Christian, and believed in the Judeo-Christian faith and belief system and morals that but for them we wouldn't have the United States of America that is a fact we wouldn't have the beneficent the compassionate the the uh, the the rational civil society we wouldn't have any of these things period and so I speak of this all the time and I try as best as I can to defend Christians and particularly particularly Christians who are constantly under attack from the people attacking them, because there's something very interesting about this. They're the same people who attacked the Jews. 
They're the same people who attack the Hindus. They're the same people who attack the Buddhists. Now, everybody has their own faith. That's great. But the people who attack Christianity are attacking Judeo-Christian values, and they're attacking the very heart and substance of the nation and the founding of the nation. So, no, I'm not, I'm not afraid to talk about it, and I do think about it all the time. I never thought you were scared, dog. You're not. I don't, you're not really scared much because I think you do have faith. I can see it in you. But um, I just think I think we're getting some warnings that are being ignored. I don't disagree with you, and I know where you're going with this from a biblical interpretation. I know exactly where you're going from it. You can see it in Israel from the Bible. You can see it in the United States, hundred percent. And I want to thank you for this call. Excellent call. Hopefully get a lot of people thinking, but I got to run. Actually, I don't run a lot. I got to kind of trot. But I don't shuffle like Biden either. We salute our armed forces, police officers, firefighters, emergency personnel, our truckers, and the freedom fighters all over the world, and our brothers and sisters in Israel and Ukraine. And most of all, you, red-blooded Americans, thank God for you. Thank you for being here, and I'll see you tomorrow. 